Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, today I will give you really a new short story, uh, which is, I think, to me, is an amazing text in every sense. It's very powerful, um, very effective. Uh, I, I think it's as, um, who, as maybe to me, I think, as... Um, uh, strong and lovely and powerful as uh, Edgar Allan Poe's style and writing. And I think here we have uh, really a very, an amazing writer, um, uh, you know, um, in this... Uh, um, he's, he's an amazing, really, American writer, uh, William Faulkner. He's in the uh, right, writing um, right in the middle of the 20th century, if you like, he was a huge novelist, I think, in many ways, in many proportions. Many people think of him as really a master of fiction uh, in, in American uh, novel or American fiction. Now, he's been known for so many, uh, uh, you know, uh, things, of course. Uh, but here we study him only for this short story. Uh, we call here, as you can see, or he called it, not us, uh, Arrows for Emily. I mean, the title here, you can see, the title really is very symbolical and very, really interesting to see um, why he's using the word there, Arrows for Emily. Now, um, Faulkner, as I said, he was writing uh, during the, um, the terrible time of maybe the um, economical, maybe some, I think, uh, some of the depression time in the 1930s and 40s, he was really reflecting a lot of the social questions and social problems in society as, as, as a whole. And here really we have a story of a young lady uh, who was um, who was uh, denied? Um, yeah. Who was uh, denied uh, happiness and, if you like, marriage uh, because of those maybe um, social attitudes, elements, and social traditions, mainly embodied by her father, her father who rejected and refused and kicked away all those suitors who came to marry her or who asked her for marriage. And this really changed her mood and attitude to become like a crazy woman or like a sick woman or like unbelievably uh, bad woman in every sense or bad girl, I should say, uh, to be able at the end of the day to kill her man or to kill her boy uh, who was supposed to be a young boy who wanted to marry her or something. So really, this is um, a strange, again, uh, very strange story in that perspective to see uh, how, um, you know, can this uh, really happen? You know, it's very weird and very strange, you know, uh, to kill someone who will not uh, be able to marry you or who will not marry you or whatever. I mean, this is really terrible. To, to do that to anyone, you know, a man or woman. And um, I think here, uh, Faulkner, I think, dramatized this and I think elaborated this and exaggerated this, I think, to the extreme. And I think, you know, the whole idea was, you know, the whole idea was not in, in the question of, uh, you know, whether marrying or not. But I think uh, Faulkner was was reflecting in so many other issues in society at that time. The American society, as I said, during the 1930s, 1920s, 1930s, when he was really talking about this question of depression and how people really went to America thinking that they will create a great world and great life and happy life and prosperous life and loving, etc., caring life. When, uh, when sometimes it can really turn ugly and turn terrible, uh, as we see here with our, uh, uh, with our heroine, um, really, because the, the short story, if you like, 
really does not have a hero except maybe the narrator. If we can think of the narrator as as someone uh, uh, you know similar to a hero, if you like, especially when we see that the narrator is society, because we see the narration all the time through the use of you know the plural sense, using always say we, you know. So normally, normally in in uh, in narration, as we know. And I think here I must say to you, and I have given you at the end of the story a, a nice little uh, note about the idea of this story being an example of really a very good example uh, for the study of point of view and a very good example for the study, the study of plot to see how the action develops and how it builds up and to see the flashback and the flash forward and all this question of rising action and so on. You can see this in this short story, really, the two elements of fiction, as I said, the two strong elements of fiction, plot and point of view, really, both of them uh, nicely dramatized and enacted <coughs> in this short story, as we shall see. Um, so that's why here the narrator, I'm saying, the narrator can be seen, you know, in many ways, I think, can be seen like like a very strong voice, an important voice, an influential voice, sometimes interfering voice and judgmental voice, uh, and so on. And as I said, uh, using the plural sense, you say, we, we, the people of this town, and, and you know, the way he said that, it's really amazing uh, in a way. And I think this shows, as I said, William Faulkner's power of writing and really skills absolute craftsmanship uh, he was a terrible absolutely great writer in every sense here so yeah i mean uh, this short story you shall see here it really deals with this theme of you know very strange and weird and wild uh, imaginative um you know thinking to kill someone, um, as I said, for, for, you know, for really no reason, in a way, in a way. And this is again to bring us back to the idea of the telltale heart, which is, you know, again, the incriminalization of people for no crimes they have done. You know, how can you incriminalize, uh, you know, for example, in telltale heart, her, his neighbor, he did nothing, only his eye, you know, and he was, he was punished by death. And this is really uh, unbelievable. Again, here we see, um, you know, this lady here, Emily, killed her man, Homer Barron, as you can see, as we shall see, killed him and he did nothing. He did nothing. He did nothing only because, because maybe he thought he would not marry her. And, you know, this is, you know, again, uh, in in um, in Emily's crazy mind, I think later on we shall see that this is a huge question in this uh, short story, which is really to do with Emily's own uh, amazing, fantastic, uh, you know, horrible, crazy mind. Really, uh, to see what she has done, uh, especially later on. Of course, we uh, you know we shall we shall see the details what she has done as a reaction against her father originally, against her father who kicked away all her tutors who came to ask for, uh, you know, uh, her hand to marry her officially, you know, in a nice way and decent way. You want to marry someone, you go and ask their parents or her parents to, you know, to accept such proposal and you propose you know, officially through the family, you know, the father. And here the father was always a, a terrible father who kicked away all those suitors, saying that they are not up to him, you know, as if to say he's a very high, you know, classy man who would not accept any person. And, and, and I think this is, you know, I think here the writer is a bit exaggerating, a little bit exaggerating, but you, know, you see, this is the drama. Of it, and this is the melodrama, and this is the fantasy. 
<laughs> and Fel said, oh, um, yeah, I think, yeah, this, now I have uh, more comments, say, yeah, uh, yes, yes, uh, yeah, um, and Fel said, Emily does not deserve that rose, yeah. Uh, well, you see, when people, when people die, you know, you, you put some roses on their graves, isn't it? You know, at least you give them a rose or like some kind of flower or whatever. So really, this is the idea, the symbolism here. We can say a rose for Emily. You know, it's a shame that she didn't get anything from this life. She was really miserably, miserably, miserably tortured by her father originally. And then, you know, out of uh, sheer luck and out of mere luck that she fell in love with another, the first man to, to, to meet her. And he turned out to be a terrible man and or a funny man or whatever, a weird man who will not marry her. And, you know, she decided to kill him. And really, this is... Uh, it's a shame, really. She has a problem. She has a disease in her mind. I think, I think the same way, I don't know. I mean, this is the idea about here, American, American society and the questions here we always ask about this to say, uh, you know, how can this happen? How can this, you know, ever really happen in reality? But, but you see, society and people sometimes are really, you know, um, it's very difficult sometimes to guess and to see how things really um, uh, operate and and that's the idea here really in 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 this uh, short story so giving her a rose really giving her a rose after being dead you know this is the least to show uh, sympathy and to say what a shame you know uh, and you put on somebody's grave a rose or a flower you know just to say well you know after death you know, anything is, is, is maybe uh, in this way is understandable. Again, uh, um, yeah, somebody is saying more comments and I think you can, you can see this uh, uh, yourselves when you read those comments and I think I like, uh, I like that the way sometimes you, um, you know, you give your own evaluations of things and yeah, I mean, Neda is saying about the tradition. Yeah, I mean, this is true, you know, about how much sometimes we are we are really committed to our traditions, to say married or, for example, rich people will only accept rich men, you know, and things like, like that. I mean, this is, yeah, it's purely traditional. And sometimes, yeah, I mean, people, you know, would, would try to, you know, come or, if you like, overcome or to try to get rid of these uh, social traditions, which are really found everywhere in any culture. And here, really, the short story arose for Emily is, is, is this. And the drama here, really, I will read it with you here today. It's, it's really an amazing. First, I, I wanted to pay attention to the you know, to the language, to the style, to the power of narration, to the voice, as I said, and to the development of the plot, to see that because, as I told you, I gave you, uh, at the end of the short story, I gave you a little, about three, four pages uh, analysis of, of the short story in terms of plot and in terms of point of view. So notice here at the beginning of the short story, uh, I will start reading here. Um, I will share with you the text for a little while uh, in case just to, to draw your attention about it and then um, to avoid maybe losing connection, maybe I will stop sharing after a little while. Yeah, so notice here, um, A Rose for Emily, published 1931. When Miss Emily Grierson died, our whole town went to her funeral. Um, the men threw a sort of respectful affection for a fallen monument. The women mostly out of curiosity to see the inside of her house, which no one save an old manservant, save an, uh, an old manservant, a combined gardener and cook had been in at least 10 years. 
I mean, look at this lovely condensed again. Remember, really, this is interesting. Uh, here we are dealing with, you know, in all these short stories, you remember I, I gave you all the time the idea or I wanted to highlight this idea of how short, short uh, novel, sorry, is are written in a really condensed fashion because we don't have time, we don't have space for details. We don't have space or time for a lot of details and a lot of description and, and, and uh, you know, to, if you want to go in, in a lot of elaboration. So that's why here you see writers writing in really direct way, in short sometimes, as I said, short uh, um, structure, I mean, the sentences uh, mostly are precise and short, and we have seen this. We have seen this in uh, ha Hemingway. We have seen it with, uh, you know, uh, again in Telltale Heart, and maybe here to some extent we will see this here. Maybe to some extent. So notice here the narrator immediately telling us about the main character, Miss Miss Emily Grierson. That's her full name. Emily Grierson. Now notice here the story, the beginning of the story begins with her death. So here we see the end of the story, the end of the story, and then here we say, I say to go back in the flashback and to go back in time. And this is how I said in the plot, you can start your story in the plot, anywhere in the middle of the plot at the beginning or towards the end or before the end or at the end or, you know, towards the beginning or maybe a little bit later in the beginning and so on. So here I will call this flashback and flash forward. And whenever you do that, the narrator has to go back and tell us, you know, all this. So here really, uh, this is a very good example when, when uh, Faulkner decided to start at the very end of the short story with the death of this woman, of this young lady, this girl, really, not she's not young anymore, you know? Um, um, when she died, of course, at this time, you shall see later, we will see that she's an old woman, really. She's no longer a woman, uh, sorry, a young lady, but because she, she was not married, she kept her name. Miss Emily Grierson, you know, when, when married people, when married girls, they, they use, we, we use the word Mrs. so-and-so. So here uh, the narrator immediately tell us, and we can see that the story starts at the very end uh, of, the, uh, of it. And the narrator, he says, our town, our whole town went to her funeral. Yeah, I mean, sometimes people, if it's, if it's a big town, you know, it would be very strange to, to um, maybe for people to, for all of the people to go in her funeral. But if it's a smaller town, yes, maybe it's okay. I mean, it's understandable. People do that. And he was, the narrator, he said this and he explained it when he, you know, he said, our whole town, our whole town went to her funeral and he said a colon here using a colon because he wants to explain the sentence here notice the men threw a sort of respectful affection for a fallen monument notice here he, you know the narrator using a metaphor for miss emily to be compared to a fallen monument you know comparing the woman here the girl the woman the lady miss emily to a fallen monument why monument I mean, why do you say monument? She's a normal girl. She's a normal woman in the town. Why would you call her a, a monument? Because really, as I said, we shall see, because really the writer here wants to say she became a symbol of the town. Everybody in the town started talking about her and of her because of what she did in the town, because of the way she reacted to the whole town. As if to say she faced the whole town in her behavior, in her wild, unbelievable, crazy behavior. And you shall see this. So notice here immediately the judgment 
that the writer gives us right from the very first sentence. The very first sentence. So the men went to see or went in her funeral because they thought they respected her or they, they thought that they were going in respect and in a kind of love and a kind of affection because the word affection, you know, meaning really care and love for a fallen. Notice again, fallen. Again here we ask, was she a bad woman? To use the word fallen and again monument. As if to say she was a great figure and then, then she fell, you know? Again here really the, the word has double meanings here to say a fallen woman meaning a bad woman or a terrible woman or an ugly woman or whatever or a great figure who committed something terrible and then because of that you know it fell or he or she fell and people will look down on that and so on so really here we have to think of the language when when it's used here they say a fallen monument and notice again monument meaning a great thing a great figure, a great statue, because normally monuments are made for mainly important people in the town, important figures, important men and women in society. So that's why here, here he's saying this. Now, here in this part, he's showing respect for the men in the town. But notice how he finished the sentence. The women meaning the woman went in her funeral. Why? Because he said the women mostly, meaning these women went in her funeral. Why? Because out of curiosity to see the inside of her house. Ah, so here again to see really here the writer is uh, criticizing the actual, the actual mentality of women who, you know, who love gossip, who want to see things who want to you know to see why this woman has never opened her house for years and years and years nobody was into her house for so many years and that's why her neighbors and her women her women neighbors everybody who knows her you know they were really very curious to see why what was going on inside her house so here i think the writer is indirectly criticizing the woman's mentality here isn't it the woman's attitude towards things, not because they like her, not because they love her, not because they sympathize with her, but only because out of curiosity and out of really, uh, as you can see here, he said curiosity and out of being nosy, really nosy, nosiness, because they want to see what's in that house, which no one save an old ma man servant. So, the only man, the only person who was going in and out of this house is one man servant. He was a servant and a man, he was, he was a man serving this family, you know, Mrs. Miss, 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 Miss Grierson, you see? And he was a servant and a cook at the same time. And not just cook, he was a gardener again, you know, he was multifunctional person, you know, which is really funny here to use this. And I think, you know, when you look at this uh, paragraph, uh, you say, wow, I think this is absolutely lovely. The way Faulkner is, is describing uh, this really in, in a great fashion. And now we, we, you know, we get the idea that everybody, sorry, somebody asking? No, I thought somebody, did I lose connection? No, doctor. No, doctor. Yeah, 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 okay. Uh, notice here the narrator wants to go back uh, immediately. As I said, he started at the beginning and now he wanted to, you know, bring us back to the introduction of the beginning, the early parts of her life. As I said, this is what we call the flashback. And now he uses this again, the voice. It was a big squarish frame house that had once been white, decorated with copulas and spires 
and scroll balconies in the heavily lightsome style of the 70s. Ah, 70s? When was that? So notice here, the narrator really went back 60 years. 70s meaning 1870s. So here the narrator brought us back, brought us back nearly, nearly 60 years back. And here, notice here, he's telling us uh, how this house where Miss Emily died. It was her family's house, her own father's house. And the way he described it here, really in a very gothic and very terrifying and horrible and ugly maybe, and really maybe uh, full of horror. And this is what you call gothic, gothic, uh, really fiction. And notice the way it, it's described here. It, he means this house. It was a big squarish, the way it was built, like a square, right? A frame house had once been white, meaning in the old days, it was a lovely house, you know, lovely decorated house. But now, after all these years, because Emily would not let anyone come in to clean it or to do anything, any change to the house, it became like a dead house, really like, a, absolutely like a museum or something like a dead, absolutely preserved, preserved house to keep it as it was all those years. And the narrator really did this in a lovely way, you know, the, the, the description you can see. Notice, decorated with copulas and spires and scrolled balconies in the heavy, lively, lightsome style of the 70s, you know, 1870s, set on what had once been our most secret, our most select street. He said, this house was located in our best, what was the, our best street. And again, notice here, he's, as I said, he went back, he went back 60 years. Notice, but uh, garages, now notice here, here, he's saying now the whole street has, has changed, the whole situation, the whole city, and the street was really dramatically changed, except this house, because she would not let anyone come near her house. Notice here, see that garages and cotton gins had encroached and obliterated even the august names of that neighborhood, meaning all this area was changed and everything, building, you know, buildings, many buildings were torn down and new buildings were built, you know, to see more decorations and lovely, you know, because people you know, after some years, they they turned down old houses and they built new ones. And really, this is the idea. And that's what he's saying here. He said, new garages and cotton gins and everything, you know, the whole area became really lively. Only, only Miss Emily's house was left. You see, so the whole street was changed into a modern life, into a modern, nicely buildings and so on except her her house and that's why here he we see what he said monument again here we, we use the idea of monument only miss emily's house was left lifting its stubborn and coquettish decay <laughs> you know really this is funny you know you said coquettish you know coquettish really means I don't know. Anybody knows the word coquettish? Yeah? Hello? No ideas? Yeah. Really coquettish from coquette. Coquette, really sometimes when you say to someone who, especially we use this, and it's used in English for girls. Um, oh, 
<laughs> no, no, Fayad said cocktail. No, 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 Fayad. No, no. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. Really, uh, the word uh, from, um, from originally, if you spoil your child, if you spoil your girl, and she will be spoiled girl, and she will ask for so many things, and she will give you, she will be given everything. And in this case, we say, well, she's a spoiled girl, or she's a spoiled, or he or she is a spoiled child. Yeah, some, not flirty, no. Hafsa said flirty. No, no, not flirty. Maybe, maybe 10% or maybe 20% or maybe 30% flirty could be. But really, uh, it means, uh, as somebody said, yeah, the lua or the lua. Uh, in Arabic also, uh, you say ghanuja, right? Ghanuja, who is really you know showing off that she can get whatever she wants from her own parents as if to say yeah 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 we say Ghanuja. yeah i don't know um yeah so really the idea is very funny here and notice how the building is described as being coquettish really because it seems that this house uh, stayed there and nobody was able to take it down First, he said stubborn, stubborn, and cockatesh. Notice, cockatesh decay above the cotton wagons and the gasoline pumps. And an eyesore among eyesores. <laughs> Again, really, this is an amazing image here and symbol or if like metaphor. Do you need to describe it when you have some pain in your eye? You know, you say a pain sometimes, you sometimes say pain in the neck or pain in the eye, which really very terrible and very bad. And, you know, when you want to say that something really, really hurtful, you used to say eyesore, you know, as if to say like you, when you have really something absolutely like a pimple or like dimple or something really bad in your eye. So here describing this, this house for an eyesore among eyesores, you know, which is really an amazing thing to use this metaphor for a building, for a house to be. And again, say among eyesores, you know, as if, as if to say that the whole street seems to be, you know, a terrible, ugly street, maybe even now, even. You see, you see, this is, this is how, you know, the writer really is, is giving us a lot of details about meanings about that. Notice, and now Miss Emily had gone to join the representatives of those august names where they lay in the Cedar bemused cemetery among the ranked and anonymous graves of the Union and Confederate soldiers who fell at the battle of Jefferson. No, the narrator is still speaking in the present time when she's dead. He said, now, after being dead, now Miss Emily, after dying, now they are taking her to bury her in the graveyard. And he said, she's not going to be buried in any, in any normal graveyard. She will be given a very stately burial, a very important burial. She will be buried, he said, as you can see here, among the, you know, like when we say martyrs. You know, notice he said, cemetery. Cedar used, you know, the cemetery which is cedar trees, you know, cedar, which is a very huge, massive, solid tree which grows mainly, mainly in Lebanon. In Mount Lebanon, it's used in some places, it's called cedar. And in Arabic, we say al arz, al arz, shajar al arz, which is really, really very solid and massive. You can see it on the Lebanese flag. And I think it's, it only grows in that part of Syria and Lebanon. This is uh, an amazing, powerful tree related, related to oak, related to oak trees. So normally people have in, 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 you know, in graveyards, in traditional graveyards, they plant these trees and they, these trees by the way they live 
for hundreds of years. They live for hundreds of years, 200, 300 years, believe it or not. So that's why they, they, they use this. They put them in graveyards or cemeteries. And here uh, it shows the respect that how people respect her, the town people really, if you like, the town authority, they wanted to bury her there. And again, he said the anonymous graves of Union, those soldiers who were, who were killed in battles, in the independence battles, you know, 200 uh, years back, now they are going to bury her among those soldiers who were really, really honorable men who fought for the independence of the nation. And here Jefferson, sorry, again, he said the Battle of Jefferson, which is, as I said, the, the, the battle of the independence or whatever you may think about it. Again, I think here the writer is a bit maybe ironical to say, <laughs> what did she do to be, to be given this honor? to be buried in a, in a graveyard with martyrs, you know, with martyrs and the great honorable men and soldiers, boys, young men and women who were killed in battle to be buried among them. They were honorable fighting for their nation. And here our friend uh, Emily, why would she be honored in this way? Again, I think the narrator here, and the writer, I should say, maybe is trying to give us a message and to really to say, what a shame, you know. Really, this is again related to the rose, to give her this rose uh, at the end of the day, you know, to, to say goodbye. And remember here in the next paragraph, as you can see, the narrator is still, is still telling us at this moment, and uh, now the next paragraph, um, notice here, alive, Miss Emily had been a tradition, a duty, and a care. Really, I love this sentence. Look at this structure. Alive, you know, comma, Miss Emily being a tradition comma, a duty, comma, and a care. What, what do you think? Look at this powerful, really, structure. Absolutely powerful structure. Why was she, why was she a tradition? Why had she been, as he said, notice here, she had been a tradition, a duty, and a care. Again, it is a sort of hereditary obligation upon the town, a dating, notice again, going back, dating from that day in 1894. 1894. So now he brought us back 30 or more 30 years back or 40 years back about when her father died, right? Or at the, at the moment when her father, you know, died. So notice here, uh, you know, the again, the summary and the, the real ideas he wanted to say um, in this language that that the respect that this, this woman, this girl had when she was alive. Again, now, now the, nar the narrative is brought back again, as I said, now he brought us back 40 years. In this paragraph, we are brought back 40 years to see Emily at this moment. As you can see here, I'm saying that this narrative is, was, was like snapshots, really like snapshots. In every shot, we'll give you some details and then you have another snapshot or another to give you you know, details about that. And here, the first snapshot to see when Emily was nearly, about nearly 30 years old when her father died. Notice, alive, Miss Emily had been a tradition, a duty and a care. Really, he wants to say how her father 
you know, she symbolizes all the tradition of marriage, how people can have, and the duty, how she respected her father, his attitude, and so on, and care also, the idea how she cared for her father, and maybe the, the whole notion of care, was her father really caring for her, or was his care uh, attrage to the negative to kill her, you know, physically, I mean, I, at least now, metaphorically speaking, killing her, and so on. And that's why he said hereditary obligation upon the town. You know, something here to do with tradition, something you inherit from your past, from your society, to do something nice to your, to your people. And here he's saying that time when the mayor, and notice here, when Colonel, Colonel Sartores, and by the way, this name, Colonel Sartores, you'll find this name used times by Faulkner in many of his novels. You know, this is really an amazing reason, or uh, would be an amazing thing to ask, why, why is he using the same name all the time in many of his stories, sorry, in many of his stories and short, uh, short stories and novels. Notice the mayor. Doctor? Yeah. Uh, I have a question because I'm confused. So is he making a fun of her or is she yes. really here? Okay. Again, please, what did you say? I said, uh, is he making yes. a fun of her or is it really tradition and care or did she deserve all these characteristics? Um, well, really, uh, well, really both because he said originally this is what her society and her people People really believe, but if in the same in the same way that the writer really is saying, well, look what happened. Look what tradition led her to do this kind of tradition. And I think this is what Nada said before. Notice uh, when you say what that she was stuck. Uh, you know, you know, stuck here. We say stuck in the tradition, and if you like, um, you know, the strict mentality of society. Yeah. Really, he is criticizing this. He's showing this to say, well, look what tradition did to her. It, it made her, it changed her, turned her into an ugly criminal. It turned her into an ugly criminal. She killed Bo, you know, Homer Baron by poisoning him, by putting poison into his uh, food or something. She killed him by poison. A poor man, you know? He doesn't deserve to die this way. So really, uh, Faulkner here is, at the same time, is driving here really a double-edged message here. Both to say, normally we, uh, we like tradition. Normally we love care. Normally we want care from our parents. Normally we accept care and love from our parents tradition and so on, okay, but not to be killed, totally killed in this fashion. And I think that's why here, uh, but don't be confused, uh, yeah, Basmala, later on, when we, see, when we see the whole story really explained, we will understand exactly what really the writer here, whether he was ironical and uh, or not, but it, you know, now we can say that this really uh, early thing here was a mixture of both, really a mixture of both. You can see it on both ways, and both ways are acceptable. Notice here, again, notice here, the mayor, he who, he who fathered the edict that no Negro woman should appear on the streets without an apron, an apron remitted her taxes. So notice here again, notice here again the funny, the funny um, uh, verb really here. Look at the verb fathered. Why, why the writer used the word fathered, the edict, 
that no, no Negro woman, I mean, this Miss Emily is not a Negro woman. She's not a Negro woman, you know? Uh, but her man, her manservant was uh, maybe like, um, if you like here, who was uh, a Negro, uh, because we have seen this uh, at the beginning. Of course, we don't, we don't see this, but later. Um, again, here, the question of racism and racial question, because you see really all American literature, everywhere in American literature, everywhere, you'll find many, many seeds of racism and racial, racial guilt. People always feel guilty about being racists and so on. So here, Colonel Sartoris as a mayor issued a decree saying no, no Negro person would, could go out into the streets without wearing an, ap an apron you know, here again, remitted an apron, which is like a sign to say, or a shirt, which is sometimes you use uh, like nurses, like doctors, like um, workers in factories, wear this, wear this, what we call apron, as to protect their bodies or to, to protect their clothing from other stuff. And here to say, to recognize slaves or black people from white. So really, this is an unaccessed racial discrimination here. So here we say, despite that this man, Colonel Sartoris, was maybe a racist man who did this, but despite his wickedness or maybe his ugly attitudes towards people, he exempted her. Notice, remitted her taxes, exempted her from paying taxes. Why? the dispensation dating from the death of her father on into perpetuity meaning from the time he her father died he stopped he stopped taking from her uh you know as we call here tax saying uh, you know she was exempted from paying taxes for for some reasons of course Later on, we shall see why. Again, this is part of the flashback. Later on, we will be explained, we will be told why she was exempted from paying taxes. Notice here, um, remitted her taxes, the dispensation dating from the death of her father, uh, on into perpetuity means to the end, you know, the end of, the, of time. Not that Miss Emily would have accepted charity. Look at this lovely sentence, meaning she did not want charity. She is a really rich girl, woman. She did not ask for exemption because she is poor, because she is arrogant. You see, this is the idea. You know, he's saying that she would never accept charity because she's not poor and she is not she does not want charity so notice here not that miss emily would have accepted cha charity you know as if to say that she would never have accepted because blah 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 colonel sartoris invested invented sorry an involved tale of the effect that miss emily's father had is miss emily's father had loaned money to the town which the town as a matter of business preferred this way of repaying you see this is an invention by miss by the by the map to explain to the town people to say we don't want taxes from her and he told them a lie if you like really a white lie to say uh, her father paid us a lot of money so we don't we don't want it we we will not pay him back uh, in cash we will pay him through the taxes that emily uh, would have wanted or would have would have really been forced to pay you know so this is the idea as i said this is as you can see here you know invented meaning this was not the truth 
you know but he wanted an excuse because he could not make her he could not make her pay the tax notice only a man of colonel sartoris's generation and thought could have invented it and only a woman could have believed it <laughs> as if to say you know what a story what a story that you know what a story that he had invented and what a woman to have believed it you know he was really here the narrator is mocking this story how sartoris created this story of her father had been you know had given already given the town money as a loan and now you know and even for her to believe this of course she knows that her father did not do that so notice here the narrator jumped another maybe uh, you know lap of years notice when the next generation with modern ideas became mayors and older men this arrangement created some little dissatisfaction so here we go on to describe after some years uh, you know the story here is being developed to see how uh, this question was was changing meaning after this uh, maya you know uh, we have more developments uh, happening here notice older meaning the people who were in authority in the town the townspeople like you know lords or you know whoever on the first of the year they mailed her a tax notice so because they didn't know about the previous uh, the previous way of asking for the tax so they sent her a tax notice saying where is your tax sent a notice a tax notice february came and there was no reply wrote her a formal letter asking her to call at the sheriff's office at her convenience saying please come to the office a week later the mayor wrote for uh, wrote her, her himself so which means she did not listen to the letter and she did not come so again now the mayor himself personally wrote her himself a letter offering to call or to send his car for her and received and received in reply a note on paper of an archaic shape in a thin flowing calligraphy in faded ink notice again the narrator saying the way she wrote the message back to them in a very careless absolutely careless and you know aimless and the way she writes notice here archaic means very old looking very funny and notice here thin you know flowing calligraphy mean the way she writes her handwriting and again faded ink to the fact that she no longer want went out at all <laughs> saying i don't go out i will not go out Mm. This notice was also enclosed without comment so she sent back the letter with the tax notice and saying i don't go out and no more no comments huh what do you think this is really amazing isn't it now as you can see really here I am reading this very carefully with you today, really to show you again the real effect and drama and psychology and the, the real, uh, you know, strong, um, you know, mentality of this, uh, you know, narrative here to say how, uh, you know, the people really believed that they knew her in every sense. Of course, the narrator here is saying, you know, as I said, he's speaking uh, himself when he's saying all the time with the using the word we, you know, all, all, 
most of the time. Not, notice the next paragraph again. They called a special meeting of the board of aldermen. So here the authorities, the town authorities, decided to have a meeting to discuss the situation. And they sent a deputation, notice, a deputation waited upon her, knocked at the door through which no visitor had passed since she ceased giving China painting lessons eight or 10 years earlier. We go back, as I said, you know, with these years here, as I said, be, saying before this time, uh, she was giving painting or China painting lessons to young ladies. But he said 10 years she has stopped this. Of course, of course. Because at that time, when she killed this man, Homer, she completely, uh, you know, locked herself in and never went out. This is after 10 years of killing him they came to knock at her door, right? So knocked at the door through which no visitor had passed since she ceased giving China painting lessons eight or 10 years earlier. Notice how the narrator is giving us information here. Notice, they were admitted by the old Negro. Now we know that her, her servant is an old Negro, a black man. So then, the visitors they came admitted by the servant into a dim hall a very dark maybe dim looking ugly damp ugly looking house notice the description dim hall from which a stairway mounted into still more shadow look at the images again to, to describe the house that full of shadows as if to say full of terrible spirits of course, terrible spirits, because we know that she killed this man upstairs, because this old, this, this, this old crime, you know, here's this uh, baron, this boy, young boy or young man or whoever, she killed him, he's upstairs in her bedroom, who was killed there. Now, now when they came, it was 10 years. So notice again, the narrator is hinting to say to us, how the atmosphere is really very ugly and miserable and, and shadowy notice more shadow it smelled of dust and disuse again nothing is used here and everything everything is ugly and dirty and dusty um i will send you i think i sent you I will check with you. I sent you, um, well, not to, not to you. I sent this to my last term students. I sent a little YouTube, uh, um, you know, uh, clip uh, about that. It's a very short film. Um, I, I don't know if, uh, let me check if it's here. Let me check with you a little bit, okay? I will show you that in a minute. Let me check. I don't know, do you? Oh, maybe I should. Oh, maybe I should send you.
Yeah, I think uh, it's not. Um, Yeah, yeah. I think I um, I need to do something else here. It's in Moodle. Yes, it is on Moodle. Please check it. It's really interesting to look at it. Check it. I I I have it from last term on Moodle. Check that because it's really. Oh oh I'm uh, oh I'm sorry. I have to stop this. Yeah, it stopped now. Yeah. So the idea uh, here to see um, how this image was uh, was shown uh, in a very really uh, amazing uh, way, um, and uh, you can see all this. I'm talking about the smell, and you know, as I said, you know, the the question of notice here dust and disuse and clothes and dank smell and it's, um, really the, the really gothic you'll see this in the film please look at it notice here the Negro led them into the parlor it was furnished in heavy leather covered furniture when the Negro opened the blinds on one window they could see that the leather was cracked and when they sat down a faint dust rose sluggishly about their thighs spinning with slow motes in the single run sun ray look at this you know amazing here description graphic description about the dust and the whole scene is very terrible because nobody nothing is being touched even this man here this the slave or i should say the manservant um is not to maybe asked not to do anything or to, to do any cleaning or anything, which is really amazing thing here. On a tarnished uh, gilt easel before the fireplace stood a crayon portrait of Miss Emily's father. Here, of course, we see uh, all this uh, idea about Emily's uh, uh, new, or you like the, the look that we get from inside her, her, her uh, living room or uh, if you like the guest room or something or you know like where you receive your guests um, and here really uh, you can see here um, the idea uh, about that and here I think we get more and more and more really amazing uh, lovely images used by by the writer there rose when she entered a small fat woman in black with a thin gold chain descending on her waist and vanishing into her belt leaning on an elbow uh, sorry leaning on an ebony cane with tarnished gold head again look at this lovely description describing her coming down to speak to them and notice here the way he describes her small fat woman in black wearing black and she's now small because she's she's a bit older now again fat woman again thin gold chain you know wearing wearing a like as you can see here a golden clock or a golden watch or whatever and uh, notice the way describing the ebony cane as a needing a walking stick you know her skeleton look again the description her skeleton was small and spare perhaps that was why what uh, would have been merely uh, you know plumness again look at this now now she seems to be as you can see he said like a skeleton now now she has become skinny meaning very slim originally before she was a little a little bit plump Look at the word plumpness, plumpish, or when you say to somebody plumpy or, or plumpish, or someone plump. You know, sometimes we say, I, I, I don't know, in, in Saudi, they use the word dupa. I don't know if you use the same word here, um, which is really funny to use. But the, sorry? Anyway, 
the idea really here to say is a bit uh, fattish uh, sort of uh, uh, girl. And uh, some people, he said, notice even the word obesity. Another notice, plum merelyness in another, in another was obesity in her. Maybe now when you look at this figure, if you look at this figure for a healthy person, you would think that, that this is a plumpy looking girl or plumpish looking lady, but because of her, because she is really looking ugly, because of, of what she is, you know, what she is. Uh, and here he said it's for, for her obesity. Notice the word obese, meaning to really unbelievably fat, because, you know, it's like sickness. It's really like sickness, you know, when you are really swollen, unhealthily swollen, you know. And really here, the narrator, again, is, is amazing in the ways in which he's describing that. She looked bloated. Again, here, the word bloated, swollen, like, like a human body or any animal or any body which, if, if it is thrown into water or like drowned bodies after, After a few days in the water, they get swollen. And this is what he said, bloated, you know, mean absolutely blown to the full. Like a body, this is it. Notice, like a body long submerged in motionless water. And that pale hue, her eyes lost in the fatty rids, sorry, rides of her face, looked like two small pieces of coal pressed into a lump of dow. Oh, it's really it's amazing images here, really lovely metaphor. You know, comparing her, her face, because very fat here. It's comparing, you know, notice here, he said, eyes black and dark, and he said, like two pieces of coal. You know coal, like, you know, which is a piece of uh, burnt wood uh, stuck into a fat, you know, dough, dough, you know, when you make bread out of dough, as they move from one face to another, while the visitor stated their errand. It's a lovely, really, description. Absolutely lovely, dramatic, graphic, beautiful imagery. Really lovely imagery. By the writer, of course. But of course, really, he meant this to be very terrible against her. To be really how ugly she is now because of what she has done to herself. Anyway, I will stop here, ladies and gentlemen, and I will continue next time. If you have any question, please, please try to read the whole uh, novel, uh, sorry, short story, uh, 